All right, good morning and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. A great turnout today from Southwest Kansas and I'm not at all surprised. I appreciate um, the good distribution you see across here from business leaders to public officials, advocates as well as elected officials. We know transportation is um, of great concern and interest in Southwest Kansas and I appreciate you being with us today. All right, so welcome to KDOT's 2021 local consult coming to you virtually today. Um, and for that, um, I appreciate you joining us. I really wish we could be in person. I know the conversations are rich and robust uh, and I, I really, really do wish we could be in person, um, but it's also very important that we hear your input and we keep pace with the Ike, the Eisenhower Legacy Transportation Program, which has been built upon public input. And so we wanted to make sure that we reach out and we hear from you today as we get forward to identify projects to move into the development pipeline. Uh, we'll have a few opening remarks from Governor Kelly, and then we'll get right to uh, the presentation. Again, thanks for being here. Hello, I'm Governor Laura Kelly. Thank you all for taking part in this critical effort to improve transportation in Kansas. Two years ago, more than 2,000 Kansans participated in local consult discussions in communities large and small. Many of you were part of those discussions. In those meetings, you shared ideas to create more flexible approaches to infrastructure improvements. You challenged KDOT to become a better partner and solve more problems by eliminating harmful internal silos. We heard you loud and clear. Thanks to your time, your thoughtfulness and collaborative spirit, today we have the Eisenhower Legacy Transportation Program, more commonly known as Ike. I signed this landmark 10-year program into law last year after it passed through the legislature with strong bipartisan support. Through Ike, we more than doubled transportation investments from 2018 to fiscal year 22. That's over $1 billion more for projects, for Kansas highways and bridges, for broadband infrastructure, for aviation, public transit, and for biking and walking paths. These investments are making transportation safer. They're strengthening critical infrastructure, creating jobs, and delivering more economic opportunities for our state. My administration is committed to keeping up this momentum. Earlier this summer, we announced nearly $1 billion worth of highway projects moving to the construction pipeline. As promised, we'll deliver one phase of the remaining T-Works projects to construction by the end of this year. And true to my word, we are on track to close the aptly named Bank of KDOT by fiscal year 23. We're making sure that transportation dollars are used for transportation projects. Again, thank you for participating in the local consult process. Your input shapes the next eight years of the Ike program, and we'll make sure we deliver the quality transportation system Kansans need. Take care. All right, thank you. And today we are, again, putting the principles of Ike into practice. Those three principles are first and foremost, partnerships, working with communities, cities and county, stakeholder groups, the public and private sector, all of us working together, identifying more options, whether that's a multimodal option, scope options, to better solve problems. Sometimes communities face a transportation problem. Sometimes they have a challenge of which transportation can be a part of the solution. That's what we're here to do today is to talk about problem solving and the projects that, help, that can help us address some of your most pressing challenges. More specifically, we're here today to add projects to the Ike development pipeline. I'll talk a bit more about the two different pipelines in just a minute and also to prepare for possible Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA fund. Those are being discussed in Washington, D.C. right now. And while we don't know the exact dollars that may come from Washington, D.C., nor we, do we know the exact parameters or requirements associated with those funds, what we absolutely do know is that we are in much better position if we have projects that are ready to go when funds arrive. Therefore, we need your input today on highway, and modern, on highway expansion and modernization projects as we want to move 
between $600 million and $750 million into the development pipeline. I think it's worth pausing here for just a minute and to think about the implications of the new Ike program. This is the first meeting that we're having under the rolling program, where we identify projects every two years for development, every year for construction, instead of having a set 10-year list of projects. There are many benefits to that. First, we can better address emerging challenges and needs and opportunities as they arise in communities. It means we have at KDOT more opportunity to refine cost estimates, to come up with additional scope options, to bring those forward to you. I greatly appreciate that flexibility. It helps us work better. The other side of that flexibility coin is greater need for transparency. We launched the Ike website, ksdotike.org. It's now an award-winning website, I'm glad to say. And there's a tremendous amount of information that's available to you to track progress and decisions. So today, the format will mirror how we largely conduct local consult although it's in a virtual format. First, we'll take a look at regional results from the survey. Then we'll take a look at project lists where you'll see updated cost estimates and some refined uh, scoring and also some new projects to talk about. We will then through uh, the magic of technology be placed into Zoom rooms for breakout group discussions about project lists. We'll then take a short break and come back where we'll then uh, have some information about recent KDOT initiatives and then get to the report out session where we hear uh, from various groups in terms of their thoughts about the project list. I'm pleased to say we've got 129 people on the, on the call right now. In every single case, we have had folks stay on until the very end, recognizing the value of hearing from their neighboring communities and what their thoughts are on regional priorities. All right, so let's move to the survey results. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic turnout from uh, Southwest Kansas. We had more than 2,000 responses to the surveys and uh, Southwest Kansas represents more than 675 responses. Your top priority by far, and quite frankly, the largest um, priority we've seen across the state in terms of percentage on safety at 38%, followed at 16% for congestion, and 11% on economic development. Now, the numbers are one thing. I think where you really get some rich, richer results is when you take a look at the comments. So in terms of safety, and I would point out here that uh, in the Southwest, your perception of safety, of, sa of the safety factor is that it's declining, it's not improving. And that is worth uh, taking into consideration. Let's take a look at these comments. Four lanes would be an excellent option, but definitely passing lanes would be tremendously helpful. We also hear, we need so badly passing lanes or better yet, four lanes. The traffic is horrendous, so dangerous. Please consider this for saving lives of Western Kansas. I take those comments seriously and I recognize the tension between passing lanes and four lanes and the need to get improvements out sooner rather than later. And that's what we wanna have some conversation around today. Congestion, and when I look at this comment, I see a component of safety embedded in the congestion comment as well. Increasing truck traffic, especially oversized loads for all the wind farms have really taken a toll on the highways, leaving them riddled with potholes and congested beyond what is reasonable. And then this one, and this one sort of harkens back to what I was talking about in terms of sometimes transportation is a part of a solution or part of a strategy to address a solution because quite frankly, government can't solve all problems. But look what you see here. Our community is struggling with workers for employers. We see that, we know we have workforce issues. We have, we have a housing shortage. Childcare options are limited for working people. It's a struggle to find qualified people. I hear that. We heard that in the North Central region. We've heard that across the state, that having a healthy transportation system helps get workers to jobs. People that are looking for jobs are not going to move to a location just because the pay is good. Quality of life has to be available. Absolutely, we have recognized across the state, creating a place where Kansans want to live and work 
and raise their families requires many elements. And a good transportation system, not just highways, but bike paths and walking trails and sidewalks are all important components of a quality of life where people enjoy where they live and want to be there. Good education for students, recreation, sporting activities, arts and entertainment, shopping are all vital. And I take this piece to heart. I think it's incredibly important for a community to do more than survive, but to prosper and want to stay rooted. These are among some of the most thoughtful comments we've received. And I very much appreciate everyone who took time to respond to the survey, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of providing your thoughts. As I said, and as the governor said, Ike was built on feedback from lots and lots of folks. This isn't KDOT's program, this is Kansas's program. More than 2000 folks weighed in and continue to weigh in, which tells me transportation remind, remains one of the most foremost efforts the state has going on. So the new Ike program, it's $9.9 .9 billion over the next 10 years to strengthen infrastructure and create more economic growth opportunities. And I asked Maggie to add this slide for today. I love it. This is from when we were out making the announcement about construction pipeline projects. And there's MJ. I remember her from 2019 when she was three years old. I believe she's the youngest uh, groupie we have for local consult. And it was great to see her at five when we moved projects into construction. And I do wanna point out, transportation investments need to serve many, many years. We're not here just to talk about what's good for today, that's important, but also what's good for tomorrow. And I wanted to share this picture with Southwest Kansas because this is uh, MJ's home. All right, so in terms of the Ike program, the biggest um, amount of funding targeted is for preservation at about $5 billion. That's because our state highway system is valued at north of $30 billion. It's one of the state's most valuable physical assets and we need to make sure we're taking good care of it. We've targeted $2.3 billion for modernization and expansion projects, the very projects that we're talking about today. We've identified a minimum investment by district. In the Southwest, we have identified at least $100 million for modernization and expansion projects. I'd call your attention to that far left column. And what you see is we've identified $1.1 billion worth of modernization and expansion minimum, project, minimum spend in each of those regions. But you may, may remember on the previous slide, I said we target 2.3 billion. So there is a difference there. That's where the flexibility comes in. We need funds to be able to flex into areas where we see emerging needs and opportunities. To date, we have identified seven projects totaling about $140 million for, the, for District 6, the Southwest District. That's five projects that have been moved to construction and two projects that are in the development pipeline. So while we've already exceeded in terms of identifying mod, uh, projects for construction and development, we've already exceeded the minimum. We know there are more needs out there in Southwest Kansas, and that's why we're here today. All right, I've talked about two pipelines. There's the development pipeline and the construction pipeline. After passage of the bill uh, last May, we moved about $1.6 billion into the development pipeline. This summer, we moved about three quarters of a billion dollars out into construction, leaving about $825 million in the development pipeline. Now it's time to put between $600 and $750 million into development again both because we know we have a rolling program under Ike and because we are hopeful that we'll see some IIJA funds also. So now we're looking to put additional projects into development. So specifically how we do that is we go back to our principles and we say, first, let's talk to communities through partnerships, hold local consult meetings every two years. In terms of options, bring new projects and more project scopes for discussion and to solve problems better, have better data. Well, well, now we do. We have updated data and better information around what's actually feasible out in the field that we'll talk about today. So in front of you today, you have lots of information. It wouldn't be a KDOT meeting if you didn't. Particularly the things we'll be working from today are the two documents, the modernization and expansion project list that you see uh, outlined in red on your screen. And this is a representation of those. 
Now, what you will see is that we're gonna talk about both lists. I'll first cover what has remained the same, and then I'll talk about what has changed in 2021. So what's the same? Well, we have the same overall process. We have the same project types, the same factors and weights. We're bringing you draft engineering and economic scores for discussion today. And we're going to assess your input to inform a regional priority score. We use scoring because it allows us to fairly compare projects to each other. I would tell you that maybe not any one score is precisely accurate, but what I have great confidence in is when you compare projects to each other in a relative sense, it is a very helpful process for be, being able to uh, evaluate projects, not just at the regional level, but across the state. We also want to hear directly from you, people who live and drive in this area, to better inform our decisions because you know best what's actually happening on the ground in your district. So in terms of the same project types, we have preservation and preservation plus. Those are things like bridge repair, bridge replacement, overlays and striping. And we use 100% of data from engineering analysis to drive those decisions. I also recall, so under T-Works, we only had preservation. Now we have preservation plus, which allows us at times to add broadband or to add some safety improvements or shoulders when we're out doing preservation work. But I'd like to point out, and I think Representative Francis is on the phone. He was in this exact conference room that I'm in today when we were talking about the long range plan and talking about how we might shift our thinking about project categories. And he sort of forecasted that perhaps someday we'll have a modernization minus category. I think what's really instructive there is for KDOT to get beyond our boundaries of thinking about only delivering projects in one of three categories and look for as practical improvements as we can find. And that's how the preservation plus category uh, was created. In terms of modernization, that's where we take the existing system and we make it a bit better by adding shoulders, straightening curves, improving intersections. In that case, we look at engineering data for 80% of the score and 20% from local input. And then on the expansion side, that's where we add to the system. That's where we add lanes, interchanges, passing lanes. In that case, we look to engineering analysis for 50% of the score, 25% on economic analysis, and 25% local input. More specifically on modernization, the engineering factors that we consider are geometrics, like hills and curves, safety, capacity, how much traffic can this um, highway hold, pavement structure and surface. A couple of other factors we take into consideration are route continuity and previous investment. So it doesn't do us any good to just look at a stretch of highway that might be five miles long because it attaches to you know, the next segment on this side and it might attach to another segment of highway or bridge on this side. It is our responsibility to provide the best system or the best network to the state of Kansas. We cannot look at one segment in isolation. Therefore, we do look at other factors. In terms of expansion, we look at current and future congestion. We absolutely look at truck traffic and safety. On the economic side, we look at gross regional product and traveler benefit. I'll talk a bit more about those in just a minute. And of course, we look at route con continuity and previous investment. Okay, so one of the benefits of this rolling program is an opportunity to refine our analysis, to create a more sensitive analysis, and to keep pace with changes that are occurring on the network. So let's start first with safety. We now consider both the crash rate and the crash frequency uh, when we take a look at safety. So it's not just, not just the rate, but we also look at how often are accidents occurring in a location. It's a more holistic way, it's a more balanced way of looking at safety. We've also updated the thresholds for scoring. And the best way to describe this is essentially grading on a curve. So as our system continues to improve, we need to be able to more finely analyze or discern differences between segments of highway. So we've essentially raised the curve, thus many engineering scores have dropped so we have a better handle on where we have our biggest problems. 
And we also took a look at um, making some minor minor changes to economic scoring. I'd like to point out that all that the first two, the safety piece, as well as the threshold piece, are in direct response to input that we received from stakeholders. Now, in terms of refining or modernizing the economic impact score, let's start back in 2008, 9, and 10 as TWORKS was put together. That was the first time we looked at economic analysis. At that time, we were all, the country was coming out of the Great Recession and Kansas needed jobs. So in our economic analysis, we weighted job creation heavily. Now, and your survey results absolutely and comments absolutely reflect this, now Kansas needs people. We need a qualified workforce for jobs. So we made some refinements in 2019 and we furthered those refinements coming into 21. We still look at gross regional product. We now look at travel or personal time. We know that people need to be able to get to jobs wherever they're located as efficiently as possible. And we divide that by cost. And then we added that same factor to that, to the first factor in 2019. In 21, 2021, now we add gross regional product, travel or personal time, and we divide by cost. We are more sensitive to cost now than in 2019 for a couple of reasons. One, we do see some concerns around inflation. Two, we wanna make sure our money lasts, our money, not KDOT's money, our money collectively, the state, all of our citizens' money goes as far as it possibly can. All right, so in summary, for the Southwest District, uh, your project list, what you see is updated data that was provided across the state, and you can see listed here the data sources that we're using. We conducted a statewide passing lane analysis. So you'll recall I said that we announced projects going into the development pipeline about eight weeks after the, bill, the Ike bill was passed. We have had time in the intervening year to get out and actually take a hard look at what's going on out, out in the field. And in some cases we saw a passing lane wasn't necessarily possible where our maps at headquarters would have indicated, or we see where a better scope would fit, or we say, we know we're making an improvement here. Let's see if we get enough benefit out of that. And maybe we'll take a look at this other project uh, in the future. We have added to so a good example on uh, US 50 in Ford County. It has a new cost estimate and we added an intersection improvement to that project based on what we saw in the field. We also see on US 83 in Scott County, we went from two passing lanes down to one passing lane because that's what field conditions suggest would actually be most feasible. We've already talked about scoring methodology. New projects have been added to the list for your consideration and discussion. Those new projects have come from a variety of sources, including the priority formula, KDOT district staff, and quite frankly, public input. People have called in with other things that we think do need to take be looked at. All right. Now, there are lots of upsides to the rolling program. This is another place, and you decide if this is an upside or not, because this is where we show our math. And I wanna walk you through how we arrived at these project lists, it's important. So you had a project list in 2019. What happened is some of those projects went to development and construction. Some of those lists are presented to you again for discussion today. We have some new projects, we have some new project scores, and we have some new scopes to discuss. And we have some projects that we didn't score for today. We can bring those back if you want. We'll talk a bit more about that in just a minute. Okay, so let's start easiest first. The projects that were in 2019 that have moved to construction or development, I think Maggie did a fantastic job here because she's identified these projects with the orange banner representing they've moved on to construction or development. You're welcome to talk about these projects if you want to. I'm not sure it's the best use of your time because there are new projects to talk about, but I wanted you to be able to see literally where these projects have gone. Now for categories two and three. So you have previous projects and you have new projects to discuss. There are a total of 15 projects that we are bringing to you today. Five of those are new. And then we have some projects that we didn't score this year. So for example, we've added some four lane uh, expressways for you to discuss. We have, um, no, that we're 
or not scored this year and move to preservation plus. So those essentially are moving forward, but in a different category. And those are the USA D3 projects. The passing lane projects weren't scored. We added four lanes for your discussion instead. Um, this is a process that we're taking across the state. An example would be there are a couple of really expensive projects on the east side of the state, um, some outer loop kinds of things. And I've told folks, we'll, we'll revisit those in 23 or 25. Quite frankly, I don't see how some of those billion dollar projects would be accomplished in this program. Certainly not in the next two years, maybe at the back end of this program, the first of the next program, I don't know. What I do know is that I was at a conference a couple of years ago and Pennsylvania DOT spoke. And I took a big lesson from their conversation. They've been using a rolling program for years and years and years. And what they did is they have project lists and they would just add new projects and add new projects and add new projects. And over time, their project list grew to billions and billions and billions of dollars. And so when they got up to speak at the conference, they said, you know, one of the lessons of our rolling program is money matters. And I thought, well, yes. Yes, it does. And then they had to go through a really painful process of taking lots and lots of projects off their project list. I wanna be forthright with you, with, with people. And if a project isn't likely to make it in the next couple of years, we want to keep it on our radar, but we wanna bring fresh projects that maybe have a better chance forward. So you're gonna see project lists evolve over time. Doesn't mean those projects are gone, we can rescore them, but I wanna to try to, insert some realistic conversation so that people have a better sense of tracking where we are in the overall program. It's that transparency piece I talked about that is so important. So in terms of District 6, a quick summary, seven projects moved to construction or development. You have five new projects to discuss. Five projects weren't scored this year. Four projects have refined or changed scopes and nine projects have updated cost estimates. And then if there's one slide that's my favorite in the whole deck, it's this one. Scoring doesn't equal programming. So you can think of it this way. You could have the best project in the state and let's say it scored a 10 and it costs $10. Then you can have projects two, three, and four. They each cost $3.3 and they score something less than a perfect 10, but they're the top, they're the next three. We have to weigh across the state, what's the best buy for the state? And it very well likely may be three projects instead of the top scoring project, because we need to build a good team of projects. We need, need to build a system, a network. So scoring isn't automatically programming, but those are the yin and yang of the work that we have to do. Okay, so we're almost ready to go to the Zoom rooms. What I'd like you to do, what I'm asking you to do is think about what are the problems you're trying to solve? What has changed or is new in your region? So in some locations, we've heard about new businesses opening that have added truck traffic. We heard in the Southeast where a hospital closed and has changed some of, the, some of their medical traffic. You have new projects to discuss, new scores and scopes. Through your conversations, we'd very much like to know projects that you believe uh, are both high in priority and medium in priority. I have no doubt that in this list, every single project is important. We can't afford to do everything across the state. So we need your help in identifying the top priorities for your region working together. So with that, um, you're gonna be automatically transferred the virtual breakout groups, there'll be a facilitator. If something doesn't work out uh, in terms of technology, use the chat box and Lisa will help get you back into wherever you should be. I'm looking at my watch. It's 10.03, which means, uh, let's, let's round up. Let's say at 10.35, you'll conclude your discussion. You'll have a five minute break. So we'll get back together at 10.40 uh, for quick updates. And then we will uh, have the report out. Thank you all so much for being here. And I look forward to seeing you in just a bit. Thanks. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I know there were good, robust discussions in each of the Zoom rooms. I was able to, to listen to several of the conversations. And I look forward to the report back. And before we get there, though, first, I'd like to give a great shout out to the KDOT team, our contractor and engineering partners as well. 
Despite COVID, we were able to stand up all of the new programs under Ike, including Preservation Plus, the broadband program, Innovative Tech, and reinvigorate some of the old programs that had been delayed uh, previously, for example, the local bridge program. Uh, so I just wanna give a big thanks to everyone who helped um, put these programs forward. And as we talked about a little earlier, oftentimes transportation's part of a larger effort. And we now have many more programs in our portfolio, so to speak, to speak that communities can tap into to improve both local and state infrastructure. I wanted to talk for just a moment a bit about uh, what's going on at the federal level and some actions KDOT's taking to try to garner additional grant funds. So against the backdrop of longstanding infrastructure priorities in Kansas and the desire to create additional uh, opportunities for growth, we're taking a look at some federal funding priorities and how we might talk about our projects and potentially reshape some of those. So for example, um, currently a criteria is around equity. And oftentimes there's a conversation around racial equity, and that's absolutely important. At the national level, I also talk about the importance of rural equity. And what we know is that oftentimes in rural areas, outcomes like health and education and income are not at the same level as urbanized states. So I talk a lot about the importance of recognizing the value of investing in infrastructure to help improve rural outcomes. We also take a look at trying to drive down greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation is the leading sector of generating greenhouse gas emissions. And you see that in the, in the uh, pie chart on the left-hand side. In Kansas, we are slightly under the national average at 24% of greenhouse gas emissions. But when partnered with ag emissions, what you see there is a 53% emission rate of those two sectors. That has uh, encouraged us to take a look at a couple of pilot programs where we've partnered with the Department of Agriculture, the Kansas Department of Ag, for a home pilot, Heartland Opportunities, Markets, and Environment. So when we're out uh, putting broadband in as part of our Preservation Plus program on priority freight corridors, we're taking a look at whether it's possible to tee off of some of those uh, corridors and provide broadband to farmers so that they can access um, platforms to take a look at carbon trading markets, crop diversification, soil conservation, soil health, and water conservation. We're also taking a look at what's going on in the EV or electric vehicle sector. We saw during the Super Bowl, for example, the private sector response with passenger trucks going uh, electric and many other uh, vehicles within various kinds of fleets. With every challenge comes some opportunities, and we want to be aware of and strive to capitalize on opportunities wherever we can find those, and to be thinking about long-term challenges against which we can take some incremental steps to address. One of those challenges is related to funding for transportation. As I've said, money matters. We have to have funds in order to deliver projects. What you see currently is about 38% of KDOT revenues is generated from state sales tax. And a bulk of it then comes from motor fuels tax, both at the federal and state level. If you look just to 2045, what you see is 60% of revenues to support transportation investments in Kansas could come from state sales tax. That's a really big percentage, and I would argue not likely to be sustainable. So we need to think about other funding mechanisms that might be possible as we see electric vehicles coming more, electric and hybrid vehicles coming more and more online and declining gas tax revenues. So one approach that's being discussed at the national level, particularly on the East and West Coast, is a road usage charge or a vehicle miles traveled where you're charged for the amount of road you use, not based on the kind of fuel you use. So we want to make sure that the Midwest, that Kansas has a voice at the table as those policy discussions take place at the national level. We haven't done a study like this in the, in the Midwest. And I wanna be super clear right up front. This is a voluntary research study. It's a conversation that will lead to a pilot study. It is entirely voluntary. 
We want to make sure rural communities have a voice, that ag industry has a voice, and commercial trucking is also present. What I can tell you is that if we don't have a voice at the table, we're likely for our interest to not be considered as heavily. Thus, we, are, we received a grant from USDOT earlier this spring to conduct a research study. It begins first with outreach, with a survey that will be coming out statewide later this week, with focus groups and conversation to then shape the design of the study. As you see there on your screen, it's volunteer-driven research. So you will be able to decide if you want to participate in the study to see how you're driving trends over time and what you might be charged, not what you would be charged, but what you might be charged if we went to a road usage charge nationwide, then you can participate. You may choose to use paper, old fashioned like paper and pen and just write down where you're traveling and how much you travel. You might choose to do an odometer check. You might choose to uh, load an app on your phone. That will be a choice. We don't even know what those are yet because we have to have the conversations first. Then we design the study and then we test or we go through that pilot study with conclusions by March of 2024. If you're interested in participating, I encourage you to reach out to Joel Skelly and you see his contact info there. We've already had many chambers of commerce and a couple of commercial fleet operators reach out to say that they want to participate to better understand their driving patterns and to provide their voice in the conversation. Charge Up Kansas is another initiative we recently launched. KDOT was asked to administer the Volkswagen settlement money. It's about $2.3 million. And we'll begin to get charging stations across the, across the uh, state. Should IIJA pass in its current form, KDOT would receive about $8 million a year for additional charging stations and other kinds of things relate, related to electrification. So stay tuned. We will be continuing to reach out and let folks know um, the direction we're headed. The RFI, the Request for Information, recently closed. We had great interest from the private sector, and now we'll be putting together the request for uh, proposals. I want to be clear, just like broadband, KDOT's not interested in competing with the private sector at all. We're just here to facilitate the deployment of that technology. And I'd like to uh, call your attention to October 15th, next Friday, Sponsored by KDOT, the Kansas Department of Ag, and 10 um, interior states, those are the MASTO states, we're hosting a virtual conference coming, uh, coming from Manhattan, Kansas, to talk about transportation, ag, and technology amongst public and private sector leaders. We're focused very much on driving down the cost of transporting ag products and expanding economic opportunities, diversifying crops, and improving soil health. You can see a link there at the bottom if you'd like to participate uh, virtually. Uh, we've got two different panel sessions, an opening and a closing session. It's really a first of its kind gathering like this in the Midwest, and I hope uh, you'll be able to participate. And with that, I think we'll bounce over to Lisa Kay to share with us the project list, and I'm anxious to hear from the various groups. And um, let's get right to it, Lisa. Okay. Give me one moment here. I'm just going to share. Thank you for your patience. It should be popping up now. All right. Yes, it is. Thank you. All right. So we'll talk about expansion projects first. The stars indicate those that were uh, deemed high priority. The arrows indicate medium priority. I'd be quick to say, we know all of these projects are important. It's all very much in a relative sense. So let's start with uh, the five stars, 618. Anybody have some conversation? Matt, I believe Matt, Messina and Greg both. Um, I was able to, to, um, to be zoomed into some of these breakout groups and Matt, and Greg, I know both of you had quite a bit of conversation and Matt, we'll start with you. Matt, you might be muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of conversation um, about this project from multiple community representatives, not just one. Um, and part of the issue was they want to have that consistency between their communities to, provide, to address the same issues regarding uh, safety, passing opportunities and truck traffic. 
as well as to um, facilitate and um, encourage further development in the industries that continue to expand in that part of the state. Okay, thanks, Matt. And Greg. Yes, we had a, a great conversation on the whole US 83 corridor and okay. just really emphasizing the need uh, for passing lanes to uh, address safety concerns. Um, 628 and 618 were the two highest priorities of the locations and really uh, the discussion in ours focused on 628 that that was really the uh, biggest need because there's a lot of no passing areas in there. Uh, we also had someone from Scott County emergency response that uh, stated that over the last four years, he had worked too many fatality accidents due to just the high truck traffic and people trying to pass. And so just really the focus for anything to improve safety along that corridor. Okay, so Greg, uh, come back for just a second. Would you say then your conversation while, you would say your conversation then was more around the corridor of 83 as opposed to just the two segments with those two segments of those priority? Correct, it really, I, I think they they felt the whole corridor up to I-70 really needs attention. They did feel, you know, for short-term goals, 628 was the highest priority and then 618. Uh, but really long term, we need to look at that whole corridor and, and their hope is that we will consider four lane in the future, but understand uh, that passing lanes would be great stuff. Uh, okay, now. let's hear a little bit because I did hear across several groups conversation related to passing lanes and four lanes, uh, recognizing, totally recognizing four lane is by far the preferred option. Uh, but let's hear, let's go back to maybe Matt, and then others, let's hear a conversation around 83 and passing lanes and four lanes. What was the conversation like on those on those two options? Yeah, so similar to what Greg mentioned um, is that passing lanes are acceptable, but there are many issues with them, especially when you start seeing some of the convoys of trucks and some of the oversized, overweight um, trucks that pass when they take up part of that passing lane opportunity. It, continues to be unsafe and undesirable to try and pass in those circumstances. And that leads to people passing in non-passing zones. So ideally four lane is what would be preferred in the future. Okay. Other groups besides uh, Matt and Greg. Uh, Secretary, it's Mike Moyarty. We had the same conversation in our group. Uh, the dialogue focused on the 83 corridor as the leading priority coming out of Southwest Kansas. Uh, certainly, it was stated the preference for four lanes as opposed to the passing lanes. Referencing Project 618, 628, uh, those types of segments uh, seem to be of a high importance for that four lane cross section. Um, we talked a lot about passing opportunities as well. Matt mentioned just now that people were uh, trying to pass in areas where they shouldn't be passing. One thing that came up in our conversation about 83 and 54 was not having those passing opportunities forces people to try and pass in town. So they're in a lower speed zone and they're driving faster to get around trucks. So there seems to be some concern about the safety aspect of those types of passings, again, in the smaller towns. Um, one more thing I would point out quickly. Um, one thing we've spent a lot of time talking about was the traffic loads and the vehicle mix on the 83 corridor. There's a lot of total traffic on the corridor. There's a lot of truck traffic. There is some concern that if passing lanes are constructed um, on 83, for example, they may not be sufficient enough to handle um, these, these vehicle loads. And there could be some concern that um, they won't be adequate or properly service uh, traffic on these corridors. So I think we, we all, certainly I recall hearing in 2019 concerns about um, in Southwest Kansas that passing lanes, some of the earlier ones that have been constructed weren't in Southwest and South Central weren't uh, long enough. And we've gone back and made some corrections to those. Did you hear much about that? So Mike, if you could come back, was the conversation also about like the length of passing lanes? It was, and I certainly meant to bring that up. Thank you for uh, thank you for jogging my memory on that. That was a significant portion of the conversation as well. There may be circumstances where passing lanes could be appropriate, but they must be longer. Uh, we talked about in particular, um, there's a section on US 83 south of Garden City where that passing lane may, might be a bit longer. 
Um, so they would certainly like to see if passing lanes are ultimately built, they need to be of a, a sufficient length uh, for the trucks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, and I'm sure, you know, I will be the first to say, I can't keep up with everything that's in the chat. We go back and look through it, but I do see, and I recognize that, um, that passing lanes are not seen as equivalent to four lanes and no one would say that they are. I understand that. I'm curious to hear from others. So I see 83 this time is high in priority. Can someone talk to me about uh, your conversations, particularly around 50 and 54? Uh, this is this is Commissioner Nathan McCaffrey from uh, Seward County. I'm a county commissioner, mm -hmm. um, and I was going to kind of bring that up anyway. It does look like there was a lot of comments that got starred on US 83, so I wanted to highlight, um, especially US 54, um, which is especially critical for, I mean, Seward County, um, Meade County, um, and then all the way to Wichita. Um, we have some current projects that we greatly appreciate uh, this, this Kansas Department of Transportation supporting already happening around Seward County, um, especially with respect to Highway 54. Um, and so I just wanted to emphasize, I think projects 686 and what was the other one, 613 um, as projects that I think are continuations of uh, work that has been ongoing um, or would help fully reduce or alleviate a lot of the truck traffic uh, congestion around Seward County as it uh, pertains to, uh, you know, certainly national beef, national carriers. Um, you know, we're also a junction with US 83, so we get uh, traffic coming from okay. um, Thank you. both of those directions. Sure, okay. Good morning. Good to know. Calvin, I think yeah, you is, were, yeah, Calvin? This is Calvin, yep. So, so Nathan was in my group. I had a very vocal group. I'm just going to say that um, by far the best group that I facilitated in all these sessions. Uh, lots of lots of good comments. Um, yes, the US 54 corridor was one that was heavily highlighted. I'm going to I'm going to give you a statistic that was given to me from um, a superintendent of schools down there in and I can't remember the school district. And Dan Frisbee though made the comment that their school buses drive a thousand miles per day to, to bring their kids to their schools. And a lot of times they're crossing or driving on US 54. Um, it was a high priority for him, um, for the safety of the students in that area, but there was also numerous comments just about continuing the, um, the four lane expressway that we are, we're currently building out there in Seward County. Um, and then the, the general comment I would say, just to add on to the US 83 and maybe some, some of the US 50 discussion is that, um, especially around Garden City with um, a lot of the wind blades coming into the depot there at Garden City, um, that seems to be the hub for these oversized overweight vehicles. And, and they seem to be the real culprits and the real concerns about passing lanes and being able to utilize the passing lanes as, as we think that they should be used. Okay, thank you, Calvin. And I would, I would uh, reference back to under T Works when we first started this idea of local consult and under modernization. I still remember the conversation about, you know, if two projects score the same, but one has a lot of um, school bus traffic and the other one doesn't, we want to hear local input on what sort of uh, you would weight as more important between two projects or two quarters that might score the same. So that is exactly why we're out to gather your input so that we can hear where you have knowledge or concerns that perhaps our formulas don't show. So I appreciate that Calvin and information about the, about the school traffic. Okay, um, who haven't I heard from? Which group facilitator? Secretary, this is Corey and I'd like to weigh in if you don't mind. Oh, please Corey, yes. Yeah, I'm re uh, referring to project 620. Um, Yes, we've, we've heard the wind energy uh, uh, conversation, but that on top of the agricultural, agricultural industry, whether it be meat packing or dairy, uh, are key users of that corridor. And on top of that, Dodge City is a hub of jobs in the region. So we have uh, competing truck traffic with uh, daily commuters. And so uh, they identified that as a high priority project. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How about um, 
were there examples of, so I know we added projects, you can see those in italics, but are there additional project ideas or needs that were not reflected in this project list? Corey, I think you might've had a, a thought or two, your group. Sorry, start struggling to get unmuted there. Um, yeah, there were some projects, uh, I, I think referring to some past projects. We had some passing lane projects that were uh, implemented uh, in past years uh, that mm -hmm. have been, been very successful. So they wanted to see us continue moving that effort forward, uh, uh, specifically the, the passing lane south of Garden City. Uh, they have interest in, in projects north of Garden City. Okay, okay, thank you. This is Nick Hernandez, City of Dodge City. Um, our group just, uh, we talked a little bit about finishing that triangulation between Garden City, Dodge City, and um, Liberal, and getting that, that connection, basically four lanes between all three communities and connecting us back to 54. Okay, right. I think some folks refer to that as the Golden Triangle, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And absolutely, the... Uh, the economic score reflects gross regional product, not just commuter benefit. Absolutely. That is taken into account. All right. Uh, any other comments around the expansion projects? Secretary, this is Michelle Needham. Yes, Michelle. Um, I just wanted to say that our group um, really did agree with uh, 628 and 618. Um, they felt that US 83 as a whole should be focused on. Um, and they, they made the great point of that their truck traffic um, because of economic development wasn't going away anytime soon, that it was only increasing. And Michelle, what about the, was there a conversation around passing lanes versus four lanes on 83? Um, it was the uh, kind of the same as Matt and uh, Mike's conversations that um, they would do in a pinch, um, but what they were really looking for are four lane. Yes, okay. Other comments? I'd just like Secretary. to add that in our group, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rachel, and then we'll bounce over to okay. Rachel. This is Rachel. And um, we had some really good conversation on Project 686 um, in that they felt like perhaps it wasn't scored correctly with congestion. Um, there have been some developments with um, truck stops out there, which we all know are important for the safety of truck drivers. And so that really kind of rose to the top um, in that discussion with safety. Thanks, Rachel. And I would highlight that as a benefit of the rolling program, which is we can take updated data into account as we take a look at these projects. So uh, I suspect our, our data isn't always as quick to reflect things that, uh, that you know as you live in the communities, but uh, it is one of the benefits is that we're able to continue to come back to projects and evaluate those projects uh, as to which ones will go into the development pipeline. No, I don't know who said that the economic score is only commuter benefit. That is not correct. What we do now is commuter benefit along with GRP are added together and divided by cost. So I wanna correct that right now. That is that is not correct. And Pete, I suspect Pete is on the line. If there are additional questions around how economic Scores are calculated, we can have Pete weigh in, but that is that is incorrect. I could just add in that the chart that you provide us with the scores, I think some of the conversation was those 628 and 618. Some people yes. were concerned because they scored lower and so they wanted to have some feedback for that. And I think some of the projects that scored higher like 613 and 620, because you already scored them high, I don't think people were participating so much in that conversation. So I think it's just kind of uh, got to be careful about just grading these because people had input because I think sometimes it was because there was a little bit of disappointment in how they were previously graded. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Okay, um, any other comments related to these projects? If not, we'll go to, I know we only have, I think two modernization projects, but um, any other facilitators? Okay, all right, let's go on to um, our two modernization projects and 156 Hodgman County. Does anyone wanna to speak to that or to the 156 in Finney County? Calvin. 
Secretary, this is Calvin. Um, yeah, so we um, had good good comments about this. Um, I, we actually had identified uh, 652, I believe, as the higher part. Oh no, I'm sorry, 651, um, because it is a continuation of the of the project that we've already um, identified and and are developing in Hodgman County. But both of these are recognized as as concerns, um, just narrow roadways, and obviously the same issue with the with the oversized overweight vehicles and just general terrain in that area. Okay, thank you, Calvin. Other comments related to... Okay, one thing I will say is that because I haven't been able to keep up with the chat, I and mean, I appreciate the chat. I appreciate people weighing in. That's exactly what this forum is for. I appreciate that. We will take a look at the comments that are in the chat. And if there are places where either we misspoke or it seems to be a misunderstanding, like whether we can, whether we only look at traveler time benefit or if we look at GRP as well, we'll make sure that we um, provide additional information if there are some, if we misspoke or if there's some misunderstandings. I'm absolutely happy to do that. This is, Governor Kelly said up front, you know, we got eight more years of the program. We're here to have conversations. We're here to get better. We, we refined some of our scoring. We'll go back and take a look at it again. But I also want to say scoring isn't programming. We have to take a statewide view. We have to remember that money does matter. So we take all of those things into account as we put projects into the development pipeline. And then everything that goes into the development pipeline still doesn't necessarily get programmed for construction because we do have to work within the amount of money that comes to us from the legislature. We're hopeful to get some additional dollars from IIJA, but we don't know that that's necessarily going to happen. But what I can say, most importantly, from my perspective, is that we're back on track. The Bank of KDOT is being closed. We only have about 63 million more dollars to go until the bank is closed, and we are able to get projects back out into production to make things better. So that is the thing that I think I'm most net helpful and optimistic about. So with that, let's go on to wrap up. So for your colleagues who were not able to participate today, this session and all of the sessions are available online. So if you're interested in uh, conversations in other districts or your colleagues weren't able to participate today, they're available on demand for about the next two weeks and you can continue to provide comments. Next slide. You'll receive a short survey after this meeting. I encourage you to please take a few minutes, provide us feedback so that we can do better. Next slide. And with that, I'll wrap up by saying and reminding you that we will have an announcement later in 2021 about projects that are moving into the development pipeline. And sincerely, you speak, we listen, KDOT listens, and together we work. Thank you for participating today. And I look forward to the announcement later this year.